Hello, and welcome to the SSE meeting. Uh, Secretary, I'd like to welcome you. I know it's the last day right now, but uh, this is, I guess, one of the first opportunities I've had to, uh, to welcome you. I hope you're enjoying yourself uh, so far. What we're going to do is we're going to diverge a little bit. Why? Uh, because I'm an entomologist and I play with bugs. So we're going to talk about uh, protein semiconductors in relation to insect olfaction. Now, a number of you probably are more familiar with semiconductors than you would be insect olfaction. For that reason, I'm going to go spend a little more time talking about insect olfaction so that you understand where I'm coming from and why I'm going to go in the direction of the semiconductors at the end of the talk. First, how do insects smell? I think everyone knows, I hope everyone knows, that they all smell with their antennae. They smell with their antennae, and this is uh, no more obvious than some of the large moths. Largest moth in the world right here, 11-inch uh, wingspan, uh, Atticus atlas, and uh, they take a look at the antennae here, especially on the Saturniids because they're so big. But it's not really the antenna itself, it's usually the sensilla. So if you get a close-up of the sensilla, you can see on this uh, scanning electron micrograph that they have these long trichoid sensilla, which we know are the detectors. And these are the actual detectors of the molecules that they are smelling, such as the pheromone or the plant odorants. Now, if I go ahead and make a cross-section now of this, you can see that the sensilla is, uh, does have some tiny pores in the side right there. They also have some dendrites emanating from these cells down here, trichogen torn tormogen cell. The dendrites are sent up. They're bathed in a saline solution. And uh, uh, this is the basic setup for most types of insect sensilla. Uh, this is where I'm in agreement with them, and uh, we do not differ at all. Things start to get a little hairy right now. Let me tell you what the current theory is right now so that you're up to date. We have the pheromones out here. The pheromone is in blue. The pheromone diffuses through the air. It lands on the sensilla. This is the sensilla right here, the outside. There is a very, very thin layer of wax. They usually embed in the wax. And when they embed in the wax, they diffuse through the wax, make their way to some tiny pores through it, and then they have to wait. They have to wait because it's a lipid. Uh, water and oil don't mix. This is water. The pheromones are a long chain 14 carbon acetate, and therefore they're not going to diffuse through it. They have to wait for a pheromone binding protein, which is pretty large, in order to come along, grab it from the pore, pull it in. It will then ferry it across the sensilar lymph. It will then make its way to a receptor, and uh, somehow binding is uh, meant to occur, whether it's with the pheromone directly or whether it's with the pheromone binding protein complex with the pheromone. And this is how detection occurs. You are now up to date, and you can now publish any information on insect olfaction because this is about as far as we go. You can apply for an NIH grant, NSF grant, and you will get funded for this. <laughs> now, what is the overlying theme right here? Diffusion, diffusion, diffusion. We've got diffusion through the air. We've got diffusion through a wax layer. And I've got now diffusion through the sensilar lymph, even though it has to piggyback on a pheromone binding protein. Well, this makes my job a little bit easier right now because when you've got a mechanism as singular as diffusion, there are some laws that you can follow. And you think to yourself, wow, this is diffusion. I mean, uh, we can predict this. Sure, it's going to be faster through air, slower through the wax, and a little bit faster through the water, though. But there are some, some generalizations that can be made. And in former talks, I've let you know that diffusion does not account for the ability for the pheromone to reach the receptor in time. If, if the diffusion is all I have to work with, and I assure you that this is all I have to work with, then, according to the current theory, I can't get to that pheromone to the dendrite in time in order to say that the insect is now detecting it. How long does this take? This takes one millisecond. No, it takes a little bit less than one millisecond, 0 0.8, 0 0.7 milliseconds. Now, to you biologists, some of you are impressed right now, You're thinking, Tom, that's fast. But to you physicists, you're like, eh, it's casual. You know, one millisecond, uh, because you guys are dealing with nanoseconds, picoseconds, maybe femtoseconds. We're, but the biologists, and if we're dealing with less than one millisecond, that is lightning fast for a biological system. So, what to do? Here is our cross-section. I've blown it up a little bit so you can take a close look to see what we're talking about. The pheromone. The pheromone I'm dealing with is about two nanometers long. But the pores are between 10 and 50 nanometers in diameter. What's going to happen? When the pheromone hits the sensilla, it's going to clog the pores. It's going to clog the pores because there's just not that much room. And it's not just the pheromone that gets in. Anything that the insect wants to smell is going to have to get through those pores and get to the dendrite. Anything. Plant odorants, pheromone, you name it. And so everything is going to get clogged because it's not going to diffuse. It has to wait for a ferry boat in order to carry it across. Problem. 
also. So the researchers looked for the proteins because they got the funding for it. Research looked for proteins directly on the dendrite. Well, that makes sense. I mean, we do know that there's got to be something there. The dendrites are, are detecting it somehow. So you take a look at the proteins, and they found some, of course, because there's always proteins on dendrites. But they were not the putative receptors, so they had to keep looking. The research then turned to scanning the genetic code, saying, all right, we can't find them directly through direct means. Let's do this indirectly. We'll scan the genetic code. We're going to look for G proteins. Why? Why are you going to look for G proteins? Because we know that G proteins are involved in human olfaction. So for you MDs out there, old news for you. For the rest of you, this is new news. So the G proteins are looked at. Lo and behold, they find them. But they don't find them uh, in great quantity. Immunolabeling comes in next. Yes, they find them in the sensilla, but the immunolabeling comes in and they show a very low concentration of these putative receptors. So the question is, where are they? And then the big one, no receptor ligand binding has been demonstrated to date. So as I stand before you, there is no receptor ligand binding. There is no receptor binding. This has not been shown yet. It is assumed. This is also a problem. Why is this? I mean, as a matter of fact, this is a huge problem. Why can't you show binding? In pharmacology, we know that uh, molecules bind to like acetylcholine, acetylcholine receptors. This makes sense. But this, we haven't been able to show any binding. So this then kind of brings me to the theory, which I've talked about before, but let me just review for you. Right now, the current th theory is about lock and key. It's about this binding that I told you about, the receptor, and it's got the pheromone. The lock and key hypothesis of olfaction says we've got the receptor, the pheromone comes along, and it binds with it. And this is what causes the message to make it to the dendrite. The vibrational theory of odor, which some of you know I am a proponent of, does not say that it's a lock and key system. It can operate either by touching the sensilla on the outside, if it's acting as an antenna, or it can simply come in close proximity, very close proximity to the antenna, and the antenna or that sensilla will be able to detect it. That's the vibrational theory of odor. I believe that insects are smelling electromagnetically. So let's take a look. But if I'm putting this forward, some of you might be thinking, oh, I, I don't follow. This is new stuff, Tom. I need some help. What's the mechanism? I mean, you've got a message on the outside of the sensilla, and you've got to get it to the inside dendrite. The electrophysiologists tell us that the dendrite depolarizes, a normal depolarization, just like a normal neuron. And a normal neuronal spike passes down the neuron to eventually reach the normal brain. Nothing new about this. So because this is a normal spike, we know the dendrite is somehow involved. If the antenna was the detector, the antenna was the detector, this whole sensilla right here acting as an antenna, then the neurons, which we do know are projecting up, would be unnecessary. We wouldn't need them because the detection is done at the level of the antenna. But we know that there's a message going down the neuron. So if the antenna is simply the primary detector, but not the final detector, then how does a normal spike, and it's very normal, get initiated in the nerve cell? And this is what brings me to the proteins. Ultimately, sooner or later, one must consider that certain proteins on the dendrite are mediating this occurrence in some fashion. But like the Grinch, but how? And so because this is going on, and I do believe that proteins are involved, but I don't believe it's lock and key, we've got to take a look at these proteins. But my problem is that because I'm not dealing with a lock and key, I've got to figure out how to get an electromagnetic message into an electromagnetic message as it passes down the nerve. Now, there is a little bit of, uh, 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 it's not just electromagnetic to electromagnetic. There's going to have to be some, uh, uh, some interplay here. And so this kind of brings me to the point where I think, all right, um, I, I need a protein, and I need it to react to electromagnetic energy. I'll search the literature, see what I can find. What do I find? Well, the first thing that pops up is probably the most studied is rhodopsin. I'm looking at you right now. You're looking at me. Rhodopsin is firing. It's a great system. What happens? In rhodopsin, which is a protein, by the way, incoming light hits the rhodopsin molecule. Uh, there is a shift in electron density. This shift in electron density causes a conformational change. Can't get much easier than that. It bends. All right? And so this is measured. This is measured because the rhodopsin is there in our eye. It's attached to the cell membrane. Cell membrane has some great electromagnetic properties to it, and it's detected. And it's a beautiful system. And very, very fast, too. However, in order to study a system like this, you can't really do it in vivo. 
It's not that, not that easy. I mean, you certainly can't do it in a human eye. And uh, the rhodopsin has to be considered in many different lights. And so we take a look at it by putting it onto an inorganic semiconductor. Let's just use gallium arsenide. It doesn't really matter, but it's attached to a man-made inorganic semiconductor. Put the bacteria rhodopsin up there and take a look at it. You shine light on it. What happens? A conformational change in the protein occurs. So far, so good. And then it's detected by the inorganic semiconductor and then amplified for eventual detection by man sitting somewhere in the laboratory right now. Well, that's nice. And this helps to give us an idea of how bacterial rhodopsin works and helps to uh, get us some answers. So this has been suggested thus far. Uh, rhodopsin is very well known to be uh, packed in into our eye. Why is that? Because if you've got a whole bunch of rays emanating from the back of the room and they're all parallel, and they're going to hit the wall behind me. How many of them are, am I going to intercept? Very few. No matter how fast I run back and forth, I'm not going to intercept that many. The ones that I, uh, I detect, great, but most of them are going to go to my right, to my left, to the top. They're going to miss me. And therefore, I need to do something. I need to clone myself. Now, no matter how unattractive this may sound to some of you, if I cloned myself and spread myself out, I would be able to detect more. Why? because these rays are going to be parallel, and I've now increased my detection level. It has been suggested by German researchers this is the way it has to be. The insect is so ridiculously sensitive, they must be packed in there. The odorant receptors must be packed. So they take a look. Immunolabeling, they're not there. Find a few. There's nowhere near what uh, we uh, needed, and so this is a problem. As a matter of fact, we found more other proteins than we found of the putative odorant receptors. Sensory neuron membrane proteins are found in a higher concentration than the putative odorant receptors. This is a problem. What is going on here? If based on the current paradigm, I've got my sensilla. A pheromone comes in. It's going to impact at a specific point. That specific point is going to be right there. It's not going to be on the other side. It's only going to be at that specific point. That pheromone will go through a pore at that specific point. That pheromone will then hit the dendrite very close to that particular point. It's a point effect. Is this the way an antenna works? No. An antenna works. If you've got an electromagnetic frequency and the antenna is detecting it, it is not a point effect. The whole antenna will light up in a more or less uh, fashion like this. So if it's based upon antenna theory, which I'm espousing right now, you're going to have a different way of detecting it. A conductor is a substance or body capable of transmitting electricity, heat, or sound. The antonym would be an insulator. But a semiconductor, any of a class of solids whose electrical conductivity is between that of a conductor and an insulator. And this is what we're dealing with right now. Or at least that's what I'm proposing. A protein semiconductor is a semiconductor, God bless you, with a protein constituent. A protein constituent. So proteins are able to detect electromagnetic frequencies, well-known, great field going on out there. So I told you we've got a response time of one millisecond. One millisecond equals one million picoseconds. Uh, the researchers have taken a look at this. Upon the absorption of light, there is a shift of electron density in rhodopsin, which begins the photoisomerization process in about 1.6 picoseconds, as measured by a 500 femtosecond laser. Well, that's great. That's plenty of time. I mean, now I've got a mechanism that works within the time period that I need, which is one millisecond. How long does it take to recover? It's about 300 milliseconds. What about bacteria rhodopsin? Resets itself in about 10 milliseconds. Well, this is great. This again gives me plenty of time because 98% of it is going to be reset in just 20 milliseconds. So it's fast detection, it's fast recovery. This is looking good. It has been shown, now for some of you, you may not think, well, this is, this is nice, Tom, but this is, I need some more evidence. Can you give me something more? I'd be happy to. It has been shown that upon strong illumination, Rhabdomyoreal skeleton shows structural changes. So they take the light and they hit the rhabdom hard. This causes structural changes in the cytoskeleton. It's a very interesting response. It's not really uh, seen that much, but it's an interesting characteristic. Kumar and Kiel, two German researchers, have found that pheromone stimulation, not just any stimulation, but high pheromone stimulation, induces cytoskeletal changes in olfactory dendrites of the male Saturnid moss. Beautiful. I've got another connection. Let me give you another connection. G protein coupled receptors. Proteins belong to many different families. One of the more common ones are the G protein coupled receptors. They are known as seven transmembrane alpha helix structures. They pass through the membrane seven times. The G protein coupled receptors that I talked about in human olfaction, 
is the same thing as what you find in the insects. The odorant receptors are the same. And so what I'm proposing on this last slide right now is what, when the pheromone molecules get close to the sensilla, they light up as detected by protein semiconductors. And this is how my theory is now being put forward. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions, and I already see one arm raised. Francesca McCartney. Hi, Francesca. Hi. Would you comment, or do you have a comment on Luca Turin's olfaction research? I'd be happy to comment on that. Luca Turin's olfaction research is based upon the vibrational energy, the same as the insects. The problem is that Luca Turin's theory looks at electron tunneling, which is a fundamentally different theory than the dielectric antenna theory. And so if you take a look at how these two mechanisms line up, they don't. They're still looking at the vibrational energy, but it's two different ways of looking at the vibrational energies on the two. Even though I support what he's doing, and I've communicated with him, we don't have much to talk about because we're looking at two different things. Uh, next question over yes. here. Uh, Glenn Ryan. Uh, Hi, Glenn. I assume that bugs can smell in the dark. Yes. So your theory requires light activation of the semiconductor mechanism. No, I never said that. Oh, because you told us a lot about how light activates the semiconductors. Uh, so that's one half of the question. The other half of the question is, uh, why do you need an intermer intermediary protein molecule to act as the transducer when electromagnetic fields can directly affect receptors, at least in mammalian systems, and an electromagnetic field can propagate right through the whole uh, yep. center part of whatever you called it and activate the cytoplasmic receptor. Yes. Uh, it is still possible that that is happening. The reason why I consider that unlikely is because the neuronal response is so clean and so basic that it, I do believe that a protein is allowing ions to enter. A uh, neuronal response is all about ion interchange. Calcium influx was talked about in uh, Lucas's talk earlier on. There's really nothing different here. And therefore, you're going to need a protein in order to have ions come in and uh, set the uh, normal neuronal response. So therefore, I do believe that proteins are involved. However, it's not necessary. Um, uh, is short antenna theory, uh, small antenna, mm -hmm. much smaller than uh, wavelength, resonant antennas part of this? Uh, no, actually. Uh, these antenna or sensilla are set up at about the right uh, wavelength uh, for the infrared frequencies which are coming from the vibrational molecules. Now, as you know, they don't have to line up perfect, or as you may, I'm not sure what your background is, uh, but they don't have to line up perfectly. It doesn't have to be a one to one, but it has to be pretty close, and they are close. Good question. Good antenna question. Can you relate this to the, um, the way the dendrites on neuro, uh, neurons in the brain work? Relate it to the way neurons in the brain. Actually, yeah, actually, uh, this is a question which is outside the, uh, uh, my talk. Uh, it would not be easy to do so because the vertebrate neuron is much, much, much simpler than the insect neuron. And I'm so happy to say that. It, uh, <laughs> insect neurons are far more complicated. Vertebrate neurons are very simple. And they're just, you know, you'll have, you know, billions of them. Whereas the insect neurons, because there's only a few hundred thousand of them, uh, are much more diverse and have uh, very different capabilities. So to make a comparison, I just can't. I just can't. And I'm sorry. Tom, on your last slide here, it seems to me you're showing pheromone molecules <clears throat> directly stimulating the antenna. But surely you mean some electromagnetic emission or property of the ligand stimulating the antenna. Can you explain what you mean exactly? Well, not a ligand in the sense that there is binding. Ligand would suggest binding. Yeah, yeah, what these are, these are pheromone molecules that are impacting the outside of the sensilla. What I am saying is that the pheromone is not actually getting inside the sensilla, which is a necessary prerequisite in order for the dendrite to detect it according to the current theory of insect olfaction because they need the lock and key. That pheromone needs to get in there. With my system, it just needs to get on the outside of it, and we're in very close proximity, set off the antenna, and boom, the antenna lights up in this beautiful display that I've set before you right now. Uh, Jim Beekler, couldn't you test this by getting rid of the pheromones and finding the resonant frequency and just hitting the antenna with that resonant frequency and see how the insects react? I uh, can't do that. Great question, though. Uh, it's been talked about for many, many years. The reason why is if you take a look at the vibrational frequencies of a given pheromone molecule, there's more than one. There's more than two. There's more than ten. 
And so uh, the insect, uh, we know, is not responding to a single frequency. It's detecting them all at once and saying, this is a 14-carbon acetate. This is my pheromone. I recognize it. Because if you start playing around with it and only putting one or two frequencies in there, the insect will get no response. Uh, researchers have looked at it. You really do need the whole kit and caboodle. And when you need the whole kit and caboodle, you need the pheromone because it produces everything that's needed. I'm yes? I'm afraid we need to uh, cut off now. Okay. Sorry, we've just run out of time. Thanks.